folks, is Westminster National Golf Course in Westminster, Maryland. It's actually just north of the town by about two miles or so north of the 140 slash 97 exchange. And not far from the Pennsylvania border, it actually is not a bad drive. This is not a country club course. This is much more of a normal half woods, partially woods, partially neighborhood course. There's some houses in, in view from the course on some of the holes. And there are some lanes with trees in some of the holes. But mostly the course is fairly open with the occasional pine tree off the tee or, or near the fairway or something. But it's certainly not heavily wooded. It's not one of those courses where you have to worry about a lot of trees on the course. Or it's there's trees certainly around the periphery of the course and without a doubt there are some trees that are in play off the tee or near the tee box even and undoubtedly some of the holes are, are certainly affected by trees but it's not a heavily treed wood course there are a few holes that do have lanes where you know the, the trees will bound the court on the fairway or, or uh, the approach on both sides but not most of them. Most of them are actually pretty open holes. Some of them very open and it is a good mix. I think this course is surprisingly good. I thought it was underwhelming when I first drove up. Although there is a clue when you first drive up to the course you do see the 18th and 9th greens which are next to a lake on opposite sides of a little lake. Downhill approach shots in both cases and it is a good clue that this course is not to be taken lightly undoubtedly the course had me thinking at times of giving it an a minus and then you know a couple of things i noticed they said well okay a b plus and then i said well you know okay if you take this other thing into account maybe a b because there are some things about the course that I think a first time player would really need to know to to um, have a, a decent round without really a lot of luck. Let's put it that way. Now, both the front and back sides start behind the clubhouse. So as you drive up the parking lot to the first tee, you will see a fairly wide open shot with some trees at about 250 yards that is adjacent to the 10th fairway and on both the 10th and, and the first fairway you know you basically hit over this large crest now on the first hole there is a downhill approach shot to a green next to a lake that has sand traps bordering it and it's a fairly challenging approach shot but nothing too outrageous it's you know modestly challenging the kind of holes that you, uh, uh, challenge that you would have on a slope 135 course and this is this course is rated 135 from the back uh, tees rain, uh, length 60 6,000 yards in golf now but on the on the scorecard it's only 125 and 5,900 yards from the blue tees I think it probably is closer to 6,000 from the back tees but I think a 125 is a dramatic understatement for this course's difficulty this course is not a 125 course this is definitely a 135 course and it is a good challenge of a 135 course with sort of the yin and the yang in that it's not that long a lot of the holes are par threes and a lot of par threes are 150 yards but it does have some longish par threes some of them are 200 yards from the back tees at least one of them i know that for sure and the fairways for the par fours and par fives will range from about 385 to 525 for the um par five sort of like 450 to 525 for the par fives and 375 to 450 for the par fours so it has enough length it also has enough verticality to make it a good interesting challenging course without ridiculous amount of verticality where you're just playing over these giant gullies and stuff but even then it still does have one hole which is a very monster of a hole. The first hole is a downhill par four. The second hole is a downhill par three to the green it's bordering a lake. The third hole is a downhill par four to an elevated green, which borders a nice 
big cliff drop off into the woods and runs along the border of the course. So there's uh, OB on the left side and a lot of trees and stuff. And then the fifth and the sixth holes come back towards the first hole and they're par fours. Um, pretty straightforward. There's a par three involved in there. And then you, uh, and then you play a 200 yard par three over this large valley, which could easily come off of Little Bennett. And then there's a dogleg left that could easily come off of, say, Hobbit's Glen. And then there's this monster par five, the seventh hole. This is a 525 yard, roughly par five dogleg right. And it goes off to the right down a big valley and comes back up the steep valley to a elevated green that slopes towards the front and has a nice sort of Coliseum style back behind it. 25, 30 yards up. Okay, and then there's a lip and it goes to another tee box for one of the other holes. But you can go for the corner on the tee shot. It's reachable at the corner. And then you have this long 275 yard shot to the green. The front side, the first seven holes in and of themselves were a good challenge and a, a solid course right there. Nice looking course the grass is not too bad greens were in very good condition and really impressed with the front side of this course then there's number eight which is another kind of hit over a valley to a table uh, sort of a, a ledge green it's cut into the side of a hill and then number nine is you're playing uphill over hill out on a fairway par five and then down to the um lowered green next to the pond uh, on the road next to the clubhouse. So that, that was a good challenge right there. It's certainly absolutely nice front side. However, I was playing Twilight and I started the round at about 3.30. I think I was 20, actually it was 25 with a card at Twilight. Certainly a, a decent price and went out to play the back nine and I was trying to get in before dark. So I had, I started the back nine at 5.30 and I knew it was going to get dark about 7, so I was really kind of rushing to get around there. I did have an advantage in that the 13th, I believe, 13th hole was swamped. And there are a fair amount of ponds there and stuff. So it wasn't like it took a lot of rain to swamp this hole because it was pretty much in a swamp. And it definitely was flooded, so they had that hole closed down. But it was a nice hole. Another par 4 where you have to basically pay out to the right and then hit back to the left across the lake to the green and I skipped that hole unwillingly but I had to skip it but before then number 10 very similar to number one except there was an even more extreme downhill to a smaller green and in number 11 which really was impressive for a par four it's a straightaway par four slightly dogleg right sort of a crescent right and you can't see the edge of the fairway from the tees, but you can see a red marker out there on the left side of the fairway. And the, the fairway curves at that red marker and then goes over a, a triangle shaped lake to a green, has a big wall behind it, about 10, 15 feet. And in that wall is cut like a, a bunker that's cut out of the wall and comes down a little bit uh, to the back of the green. And then there's a lot of high grass in the top back of the bunker. And this is a no joke kind of thing. You rarely do you see grass growing in a bunker on purpose. There goes. So in any case, that was another good challenging hole. So a nice hole went from there past 13. As I said, 13 was uh, really unplayable due to the uh, swamp fairway and 14 goes along the back of the 18th tee box and goes down the side in front of a house and it's sort of a blind shot over a, a crescent right and then there's a green sort of like a, at the top of a cone at the bottom right side. So there's two tricky parts. One, it's OB just off the car path on the right and you can't see the car path once it crosses over the hill. You want to play left and a lot of these holes that are running along the side of the course very simply, you don't want to play up on the side. You want to stay out towards the, the center. And the trick is to actually not play up on the sides when you're trying not to play up on the sides because there's a natural tendency to overplay the shot and then put it right where you're trying not to play it. 14, 15, 
you know, an, an interesting par four, nothing too outrageous. The whole trick is to stay and play off the tee box and hit to the green and not go way behind the green and because there's another steep drop off into the woods in the corner of the course. Then there's a fairly straightforward shot, which is very similar to a shot at Clustered Spires, which I like, which is almost the same hole, number 15. And it, it's sort of like out of a chute. And then there's a hard fence on the right side, OB, and then it goes back uphill to an elevated green. And uh, I took shots of this when I took the shot, the, someone had dropped the flag on the green and left it. So you couldn't see it. And that's what, why, you know, there's nothing in terms of a flag there. But I think I did take a shot of the green uh, anyway after I got to the top. But um, again, a challenging tee shot to come out of this lane of trees from the back tees and not go over to the right into the woods on the right side of the course where there's OB. And then the next hole is really, 16 is kind of a weird hole. I didn't really like it that much because it was wide open out off the tee. You know, there, there were stakes for, I think it's the... 14th fairway going to the left and there's stakes for what I believe is the fifth hole on the right and you can see these sand traps and stuff and they're the only guide to the fairway and the fairway is very narrow landing area between all these stakes and the sand trap and everything and then it goes sort of a, like a 45 degree to the right and goes up to the elevated green and the green has a very steep slope behind it. It drops down to the second green behind there. You will see this area of the course quite often as there's a lot of racing around there in the car path going between different holes. And um, this hole is a downhill sloping green that, it, again, you do not want to be long on this hole, on this green. There is a very steep drop off behind it and it's a simple pitch uphill, slightly uphill to get to the green which you absolutely do not want to be long. In any case, that gets us to the 18th, which is another big par five, fairly large amount of room to hit on off the tee, but there's like a, a, a downhill slope to the right, and they actually have a bump there to catch balls that catch the edge of the fairway and go off to the right before you go down in the woods. And I found my ball on top of that bump, which is nice that it didn't roll off down to the woods and played down and had a nice um, closing shot down to the green. Overall, I think this course is a decent course. And I would give it a B at least, a, maybe even a B plus, except for one problem. And it's the same problem I've had at a lot of courses in Northwest Maryland or North Central Northern Maryland, um, like clustered spires, a lot of courses because there's a freaking airport less than half a mile away from the course. B17, B24 showing there like the next weekend and stuff like that. So I don't mind driving out there. I actually enjoy it. It's much better for me um, than just barreling out 70 and going up 15 or going up 270 or west to uh, Hagerstown or going up 83 west to, to York or north to York, you know, things like that. I don't really enjoy doing that time and time and time again. I'll, I like taking the back roads as long as they're fairly, you know, direct and there's not too much traffic, not too many intersections and not too many, you know, rows on a, on a repair. It's a great drive. This course, likewise, is a good drive in the country. Okay. And I enjoyed it. The one downfall that I have with this kind of thing is all these little regional airports around the golf courses that are out there. When you're out playing a course, and especially if you're playing Twilight, they tend to have a bunch of small planes, Cessnas, beach craft, stuff like that. Maybe, you know, like around cl clustered spires, they were, they were even ultralights and stuff. Flying patterns around, you know, touch and goes, flying around and around and around, using the golf course as a reference. And you get to hear them when you see them coming over the trees, you're like, oh God. And you just get louder and louder and louder. And they go drifting by slowly. It probably takes about three minutes for them to, to do their loop over the course and fly back. The whole time I'm just like going, oh God, fuck. 
What am I going to do about this? What am I going to do? Try not to hit a ball at the plane. Literally. They were that annoying. So, um, no, it's not an A minus, which I thought at first I was going to give it. No, it's not a B plus because the course doesn't quite rank up. The front side is pretty good, but the back side is a little bit less as, than, than as good as the front. And it just doesn't quite rank up as a B plus. I mean, it's, it's good without the planes. I would give it a B with the planes. I have to give it a B minus. It's just that simple. Go play the course early enough where you don't have to deal with the planes or suffer the consequences. That's Westminster National in Westminster, Maryland, a little bit outside of Westminster on Route 97, north for, towards Union Mill and then towards Gettysburg. On the left, sort of barn slash clubhouse. I gotta tell you, I was really liking the course before about six o'clock. I can't tune it out, and I'm sorry, I gotta, I gotta notch it. It's it, almost as bad as clustered spires in that regard, okay? It's, it's really that bad when they start flying, those touch and go, go loops. Other than that, it's a pleasant, fun, challenging course. Westminster National. And I give it a B minus as a result.